Well, this year our annual church theme is called Living Life Together. It's our contention that most people in our church have lots of acquaintances. I know, for example, that I have 290 Facebook friends. How many of you got more than that? Yeah, like everybody who has a Facebook account has more than I know. And then who knows how many people I am connected to through LinkedIn. So you guys in LinkedIn? You know, my guess is that the connections that I have, if you go like five or six people out, I'm connected to everyone on planet Earth. But how many people do I have, how many people do you have that would fit the litmus test for friend based on the Bible? Let's consider just a few passages to kind of help us think about that for a minute. The first one is, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Some of you have brothers. You know exactly what that passage is talking about. A friend loves at all times. Do I have any of those? Who are the names of people that fit that characteristic? Or a man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. How, how many of those do I have? How many of those sticks closer than a brother friends do I have? Or maybe this one, do not forsake your own friend, your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house on the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother far away. Now, how many of those do I have? It seems to me that most of us move closer to family rather than closer to friends. Is that because we really don't have very many of these kinds of friends? Is it because that when it comes right down to it, I don't have any friends that really are like family? Is it because I really don't have a place to go when I'm hurting or suffering, and so the only thing I can think of is to run back home? Or is it because I don't have anybody in my life who has really locked arms with me and gone to war with me? We're concerned that at least a some portion of you would say, you don't have any friends like this. And as a result, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to develop friendships that accurately represent these kinds of biblical truths. So part of making it easy is helping us understand some of the core elements of friendship. After all, if we have the idea of this, here's what friend is. It's somebody who makes me happy. Or, or here's another idea of a friend. It is somebody who is going to give me everything that I want. If that's what we think friendship is, then we have the wrong idea of friendship. So last week, Pastor Ryers taught us about one of the core elements, and that was hospitality. He helped us see that being a friend is inviting people over into our home and spending time with them, even in the midst of very busy lives. And so rather than simply finding somebody who is going to be a friend to us or someone who is going to serve us, our task became being a biblical friend to serve somebody else. Now this morning, we're going to consider a second element, and it is this, praying for one another. And with that in mind, please turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Now let me just say, to start off with, that if it were a requirement for speaking this morning that I had handled this area in my life perfectly, then I would have had to tell Pastor Byers, look, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, but you're going to have to assign this to somebody else. I'm in the trenches with you. In fact, maybe I got this assignment so that he would let me hear my own sermon three times. <laughs> I'm with you. You might have saw this title and thought, man, I'm convicted already. You haven't even said anything yet. You haven't even opened up the word yet. I'm with you. So we're going to see how we can all get to a better place on this subject of prayer. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. It says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it, that is, in prayer, with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in a way I ought to speak. Now, let's think a little bit about this connection between prayer and friendship. And I would like to start that by having us think about this. You know, sometimes 
our friends have issues that can be fixed. You know, I have said before, I've mentioned it publicly, that I'm not exactly very handy. It's not that I don't wish I was, I'm just not. And so I have people that I know that are friends of mine that could come and help me out. So if my car has a problem, I can get that fixed. And I get rolling back again. You know, if I have a problem with my house, I know some people that come help me out, and that problem can get fixed. If my computer decides to, like, barf, then that can be fixed too. You've had those moments, right? But, you know, there's other times in life where we face challenges or our friends chase, face challenges that just can't be fixed. I have the privilege of, of working with young couples in our church done so for several years. And you know, sometimes there is a young couple that would really, really like to have a child, but for one reason or another have been unable to conceive. You know what? I can't fix that. And I can't take the hurt away that comes with that. There are people in our church today that are receiving treatment for cancer. We can't fix that, can we? We can't make the the pain and the hurt and the hardship of the treatments go away. Stephanie and I have been friends with people who, in one situation or another, the husband or the wife has just decided they're not interested in doing what's right before the Lord anymore. And so they're suffering. And, you know, we cannot fix that or take their hurt away. There are some who have lost a father, a child, a husband, a wife, a grandfather. And, you know, we can't fix that either. There are some singles around here who would really like to be married. And despite some efforts on my part from time to time, I can't fix that either. (laughs) We know of families in our church who have grown children who have walked away from the Lord. And they're grieving over the decisions that their kids are making. And we can't fix that. You know, I could go on and on for 10 minutes about this, but the point is there are times in life where our friends have things going on that we just simply cannot run in and fix. It's not like a car. It's not like a home repair. It's something far more significant and far more important. But one of the things I can do as their friend, and a very significant thing that I can do as their friend, is to pray. Look at Colossians chapter 4. It says, devote yourselves to prayer. In other words, let's start off with the first point of the text. We're to be devoted to prayer. Now, since we're in chapter 4, it'd be wise to kind of highlight at least a couple of points about what Colossians is about. Paul is writing, as we have seen in his imprisonment, and he's actually been in some kind of imprisonment or house arrest for the past four to five years. So Paul actually did not start the church in Colossae, but rather had sent others to preach the gospel. And in the meantime, there arose some questions about Jesus. And and you know, here is Paul's thinking, you know, you could be wrong about a lot of things, you just can't be wrong about Jesus. You know, like how many of us pick Richmond to be in the Sweet 16, right? We can be wrong about a lot of things, but we can't be wrong about Jesus, And so he writes so that the work of Jesus is highlighted throughout this epistle. He writes so that the supremacy of Jesus is highlighted in this epistle. And based on the person and work of Jesus, then he explains there are certain instructions that now I'm going to give you. One of those instructions is to be devoted to prayer. Now let's just unpack that first word for a minute here. It's the importance of devotion and commitment. Not surprisingly, this word describes the kind of attention, commitment, or passion that we should be bringing to the activity of prayer. And prayer and devotion are put together in a number of passages of Scripture. Here's just several of them. First, Acts 1.14. These were all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. That is the initial group of apostles and early believers prior to the day of Pentecost along with the women and Mary, the mothers of Jesus, and with his brothers, continually devoted to prayer. Then, after some 3,000 people come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, we see this. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
Not long after that, as the church begins to uh, continues to grow and add more and more and more and more people, the apostles were beginning to get overwhelmed, and so they had selected a group of people who were going to help them, and this is what they say their job will be. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then in Romans 12, the passage Pastor Byers spoke from last week, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. In other words, part of being in the church has always been a commitment and expression and intense effort regarding the matter of prayer. This intense effort, this desire, this devotion, this willing to be continually committed to something is seen in a few other passages not related to prayer. Uh, For example, this, day by day continuing with one mind in the temple just describing the early church activities that here were the things that they were committed to. Here were the things that they were giving some intense effort toward. Or in Romans 13, 6, a very appropriate time for passage for this time of year. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. That is the task of ruling. So if you and I are going to give Jesus first place, and demonstrate by our lives that we appreciate and that we value all that he did for us on the cross, then we must give significant effort to the matter of prayer. Intense effort, right? Intense effort. That's what he's calling us to. Well, you know what? The tournament is going on right now, huh? And just before the tournament, I saw an article by CNN. And here's what CNN said that CBS was concerned that it was actually going to shut down their website because so many people were going to be downloading and streaming the basketball games this week. Okay, so let's just put that one together. In other words, the productivity of the American workforce was 50% or less this last week because the basketball tournament was on and so many people were going to be streaming it at work that CBS was concerned they were actually going to have to shut down the website. I admit, the games are fun to watch, the last second shots are cool, the big upsets are exciting, all that's fun. You know, there seem to be a whole lot more people these three weeks fired up about who's going to win the basketball game than they are about the things of God. They know how to give intense effort, but maybe just intense effort over the wrong things. You know, I'm preparing to run the Indianapolis Mini Marathon this year. And I'm the type of person that, you know, just finishing isn't exactly what I had in mind. You know, I kind of have like a goal to to reach for. I want to not just survive, but I want to actually run a time. And so there's an intense effort that's going into that task. And so I have to answer the same question. Do I care more about running the time that I'm interested in than I do about the things of God? And specifically, the matter of prayer. I have to ask that question. So, so do you. Are there things that you are passionate about? The things that you're devoted to? Things that you give intense effort toward? And is prayer on that list? You need prayer, and so do I. And so the text continues on. Not only are we to be devoted to prayer, but it actually describes a little bit about that, what that devotion is supposed to look like. It says to keep alert while you pray. Notice verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. That is in prayer. So I would venture to say that if I fall asleep within 30 seconds of the time I start praying, that I'm probably not doing this. I think there's also a sense in which when I pray, am I thinking really about the end results of this prayer? You know, for example, we pray to Christ who is one day returning. And so is there a sense in which when I'm going to God in prayer that I have this mind that I'm actually praying ultimately that God would, that Christ would return and make all things right. And then maybe part of this implication of just staying alert is that informed prayer is likely to be more purposeful, personal, and powerful. In other words, there's something, some amount of focus that I'm giving not only to the Lord, but also to the people that I'm praying for. Maybe we could illustrate it this way. I put myself in this category, so maybe you'll identify with me. 
I've been caught not listening very well. A- any of you been caught in that? You know, sometimes we can kind of get away with it. You know, we can kind of give some nonchalant answers that kind of cover broadly. And so, you know, we kind of rescue ourselves from not really listening. But then every once in a while, we really get caught. So here I am, reading the paper, opening the mail, thinking about a task that I haven't finished yet, or pondering some issue that has yet to be resolved. And then I get asked this question, what would you like for dinner? And I respond, yes. It becomes very obvious that I was not listening to the question. Or, you know, now that my wife asked me that question and my son kind of chuckles and realizes, you know, this is a great opportunity. Dad, can I have a hundred (laughs) bucks? Sure. Then the other son is like, whoa, this is a really good opportunity. Dad, can I have the car in two years when I turn 16? Uh, uh Uh-huh. And then, then all of a sudden, everything starts coming down like, Rob... Hello, Earth to Rob, do you realize what you've just done? You just told Samuel he could have 100 bucks and Joseph gets the car in two years. Do you realize what you just decided to, to agree to? So here we are. We admit we've been caught not paying attention. I wonder if that's the way we pray. Again, learn from me. Maybe you've never had this experience. I have listened to someone pray and I've heard three words. Let's pray and amen. I have no idea what happened between those let's pray and amen, but I have, you know, I kind of checked out. I went to sleep. I uh, went off into la-la land. I wasn't committed. I wasn't alert. I think this passage, really, when it comes right down to it, is drawing us to things like this. When you pray for Karen's cancer, pray as if you mean it. Pray as if you're asking God to actually intercede. And whether that's simply to pour out His grace on Karen so that His grace will sustain her in the midst of her suffering, or whether He is going to actually rescue her from her cancer, pray as if you mean it. Or when you're praying for Tom, that Tom would take a step of growth in his walk with Christ, that you're actually thinking about Tom and the steps that he needs to take in order to live more faithfully like Jesus. Rather than the hundred other things that you need to do as soon as you get done praying, or when you pray for your pastors, that they would be faithful and wise and godly in their dealings, that they would give Jesus a good name, that you're actually thinking of us. You know, if we're honest this morning, I think we would say that's the way we pray when we're hurting. In other words, there have been times, you could identify with this too, when I have been on my knees begging God for something. Because it was significant. It was important. It meant something. And so I was on my knees begging God for it. I have, with tears running down my face, asked God to intervene and to rescue me from something. I remember before my senior year of high school, I wanted to do really well in our cross-country season. And so despite the fact that the summer was just unusually hot, we had like 46 days above 90 and six days above 100, I faithfully trained for the cross-country season that was coming in the fall. And I remember, we all knew, day one's practice was a six-mile timed run over a very hilly course to sort of find out where everybody was. And the coach kind of knew, depending on how you did on that initial time trial, that would be the kind of the way in which he could map out the kind of times you would get during the season. And I'd done pretty well. I was really encouraged by my initial time trial. And everything then fell apart. It was like I was running with irons in my shoes. And I remember the, the home meet that we had And after everybody had gone, I mean, I just laid out on the course, and I was just crying and asking God, what in the world? I have committed so much time and so much effort to all this. I trained when it was hot. I ran at night. I did all of this to prepare, and now here's what the result is. Nothing. Nothing. God, why? Rescue me. Intervene. Well, you know, 
If we've prayed like that about ourselves, then why wouldn't we pray that way for each other? So if I would pray like that for me, why wouldn't I pray that way for you? And if you would pray that way for you, why wouldn't you pray that way for me? See, that's the way we should pray for our friends. That we want God to actually rescue them. That we want God to actually keep them from sin. That we want God to give them blessing. That we want God to intervene in their life and do something significant and wonderful and powerful. Acquaintances are 290 Facebook friends or 462 or 1,280, whatever, they don't get that kind of effort. They don't get that kind of intensity in the way that we pray. So let me ask you, are you this kind of friend? Do you have anyone in your life that's this kind of friend to you? If you would answer these questions, no then I want to encourage you to take a step of growth today. Be this kind of friend. Pray for people like this. And and then communicate to them that you're actually praying for them and that that you want God to work in their heart and in their life. Pray for people in your ABF with an alertness worthy of you actually wanting God to do something about it. And if you don't have an ABF, then find one. People who you serve with. You serve in children's ministries. You serve over in the community center. Whatever your areas of service are, pray for your fellow workers. That God would do something wonderful in their life. Don't wait for others. Don't just wait and say, you know, I don't have any friends. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll go eat worms. All right, you be that friend. Don't wait for others. You be that friend. Now, the text also continues that our prayer should be made with thanksgiving. It says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it, that is, in prayer, with an attitude of thanksgiving. In other words, sometimes we can be fooled in the midst of our struggles that prayer actually doesn't do anything. It's not going to change anything. And so, why pray anyway? We're never going to be able to have kids. Our cancer is not going to go into remission. Our brother, our cousin, our father will never come to Christ. Our children will not come back to the Lord. Or in Paul's case, after sitting in prison or house arrest for the past four years, he'll never be released from custody. And instead of succumbing to prayerlessness because of this attitude, I want to encourage you that This text is reminding us to pray with thanksgiving because we serve a living Jesus. Jesus meets us in our struggles. He comforts us in our pain. And sometimes he fixes our problems. Jesus has the power and authority to help you not only in the midst of suffering, but to deliver you from it. That's one of the things the church at Colossae had not properly understood. In fact, let me just roll the the passage back just a bit. In chapter 1, in verse 10 of Colossians, Paul says, here's one of my prayers. My prayers is that you would walk worthy of the calling which God has called you, and to please the Lord in all respects. And then in chapter 1, verse 18, he says, he is the head, that is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he will come to have first place in everything. Then in verse 28, he says, here's one of my missions. We proclaim him, that is Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Then chapter 2, verse 3, talking about Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Chapter chapter 2, verse 13, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Then in chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Then verse 17, 
Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him to God the Father. In other words, Paul keeps coming back to, and back and back and back to Christ. Why is it that we can give thanksgiving? Because Jesus is on the throne and that our hope is secure and that he's more than able to grant any request necessary to give his name first place in everything. So praying with thanksgiving doesn't mean that God will give us exactly what we want when we want it. He is not a genie offering a thousand wishes. But we can give thanks to God. And we can pray with thanksgiving. Because he can grant to us and to our friends what we're praying for exactly as it is according to his will. And so that God will be able to provide whatever grace is necessary to sustain us and our friends in the midst of either blessing or hardship. And so the application is pretty clear, I think. We have to take a step of growth by becoming much more intense in our praying. We need to pray with an alert mind rather than one that falls asleep in 30 seconds. We need to pray thinking about the people that we're praying for and asking for their requests with a sense of urgency as if it really matters. And at the same time, instead of struggling with hopelessness, we remember that Jesus is on the throne and therefore can give thanksgiving in the midst of our prayers. And so here's a baby step. Pick two people that you're going to pray for this week. So don't just listen to a message that has to do with prayer and then say, oh yeah, that's cool, great, we have to pray more, got it, and then walk out and do nothing. But instead, pick two people that you're going to pray for, and I mean pray for, and make sure you know something about them, and pray with a commitment to these people as if you genuinely care whether or not God is going to do anything in their life or not. Well, verse 2 is the command to pray. Verses 3 and 4 begin to help us see what we should be praying for. And so let's be devoted not only to the idea of prayer, but to actually praying for the right requests. Notice what it says in verse 3. Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been in prison. You know, I think we're pretty familiar with the typical requests, issues of health and safety and protection and success. And those are all legitimate things to pray for. But the danger is this, that that becomes all that we pray for. That becomes all we pray about. In other words, the only thing that we then care about is their health issues or their safety or their protection. In verses 3 and 4, as we think a little bit about Paul's situation, he could use prayer requests along those lines and yet doesn't ask for them. Paul is in jail historically speaking, because the Jews hate him. And sometimes Roman governors did stuff to make people, particularly the Jews, happy. In fact, we find in Acts, as Paul goes through these trials, that one of the reasons they keep him in prison is because they want to do the Jews a favor. And so they just keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And then someone comes along and says, well, you know, Paul's got a pretty popular name. So I think we're going to be able to get a bribe out of him. And so let's just let him hang out there for a while until he's able to rally the kind of money that we think he should get in order for us to release him. And none of those things happen. So here he is sitting under this house arrest situation for a long time, like four to five years. And we might be thinking, well, you know, Paul, you should be praying for justice. You should be praying for your health. You should be praying for your financial needs. You should be praying for your protection. You should be praying that God would kill these people who keep making it hard on you. Here's what he prays for. Of all the things he could have asked for, he says this, I just want an open door for the gospel. Just give me an open door for the gospel. He's not complaining. He's not looking for them to, to get him out of his mess. He's not asking that the church at Colossae pray that God would deliver him. He simply asks for an open door to the gospel. Give me an open door so that I can share Christ with others because this is what they need. Is that what we're looking for? 
Is that what our friends are looking for? Well, the next thing he requests, not just give me an open door, but verse 4, he says that I may make it clear in a way I ought to speak. In other words, he prays for a willingness to use that open door as effectively as possible. So he's not just simply saying, God, would you give me an opportunity? He's saying, would you give me an opportunity and then give me the strength to carry out that opportunity in a productive way? You know, maybe you've been there too, where you have, in essence, asked God to help you share Christ with those at work, and then you get an opportunity, and then either because of fear or because of uh, busyness or some other reason, you decide, well, you know, now it's not right not the right moment. And you kind of back away, and then you look back, and you think, boy, I wish I would have taken that opportunity to speak as I should. That was Paul's request often. In fact, in Ephesians 6, when he writes to that church, he says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf, that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. One of Paul's heartbeats was, look, I want to have open doors, and then I want to walk through them well. Is that what we're wanting? Is that what we're praying for our friends to have? Oh, so we just kind of unpack this a little more. I could have listed a lot of Paul's prayers, but here's just a couple of them. He prays that, that the people, the church, would abound in love. In 1 Thessalonians 3.12, he says, And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as also we do for you. See, we understand that loving God and loving others with our whole heart is not very easy. We can't do it on our own. And so we need to ask for God's help. We need Christ to help us to love others. And so that's what we pray for. Uh, what about this? Do we pray that you would be blameless? Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, one of the things Paul prays for that church is, look, when Jesus comes back, you want to be ready. You want to be mature. You want to be complete. In other words, he's praying for spiritual growth. So is that something we pray for? Is it just the health requests, or is it more than that? Is it spiritual growth? Then that we would understand God's will. Colossians 1, 9, and 10. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we've not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In other words, two weeks ago, we spent a particular day in the history of our church family to pray as a group and to ask God passionately for what it is that He would like from us. What, what is this Purdue facility supposed to look like? That's what we were asking God to reveal. And so do we pray for things like open doors, a willingness to take advantage of those doors, a blameless life, abounding love, a greater understanding of God's will in our friends' lives? That's part of what it looks like. So Colossians 4 really is calling us to something profound. It is calling us to pray with a measure of intensity and effort. It is calling us to be alert, to be focused, to be concerned about what God's answers might be. It is calling us to pray not solely for health or safety, protection, success, but greater likeness to the Lord Jesus. Now, one more little piece here. And that is, remember that prayer is a significant part of your ministry to your friends. Not a casual part, a significant one. There are times we can't fix something for our friends. But we can pray, and prayer is important. James Dunn, in his commentary, said this, Paul had no embarrassment in understanding prayer as asking for things on behalf of people. Such prayer was not selfishness, 
but a recognition of dependence on God for the opportunities to serve Him and the enabling to do so. So Paul does not hesitate, rather is eager to ask for prayer for himself and his work. Prayer is significant. Now, I haven't shared this uh, publicly before, but it is a little interesting story. My parents came to the Biblical Counseling Training Conference in the late 90s. I think there were about 500 people here at that time. And um, they, as a result of the week that they were here, my mom went back. And my mom went back praying and asking God that he would open up an internship here for me. I was a seminary student at Baptist Bible Seminary at the time when they came to the conference. And uh, I had not heard of this church. They hadn't either until they got this counseling idea. And so my parents came. And then my mom just quietly began praying that God would open up an opportunity for me to come here. And you know, that opportunity came. And I got to be an intern here. But not only that, but obviously I'm on staff more than just as an intern today. And so here's the reality. My mom's prayer was answered this way. My mom's name is Peggy. And God, in essence, said to my mom, Peggy, you can have not only your request, but you can have more. And not only will I put your son as an intern, I'll give him a place there to serve long term. How does that sound? Friends, it's significant. Prayer is significant. That's not casual. That's not meaningless. And even though we can't fix something, we can pray, and that prayer is powerful. In fact, there's no shame in it at all because it's actually becoming like God. Check this out. It is one of the current ministries of the Spirit. In Romans 8, 26, it says, In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. It's also one of the current ministries of the resurrected Jesus. In Hebrews 7, it says, The former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't that great? I mean, when we don't know what to say, the Spirit prays instead. And we have the Lord Jesus who prays all the time. That's pretty significant, huh? And then last, it provides a wonderful opportunity to celebrate God's work together. You know, I don't know what the answers will be on this whole Purdue property thing. I mean, maybe in the next few weeks, God will give us something and it will be permanent and we'll have something to celebrate together. Maybe all of the sites that we look at from here until for the next 20 years have a toxic waste dump underneath. I don't know. But here's what I do know. It's going to be fun to celebrate God's answers to prayer together, right? It will be exciting to do that. And so let's not count this as something meaningless, as insignificant, or not very powerful. Instead, we're called to be devoted to prayer. Let's stand together to pray together.